Okay, so um, I, I mentioned looking up Wikipedia entries for our speakers so I could be well informed. Uh, and our next speaker, Claudio Pellegrini, has a substantial one, which I printed out without reading. And then when I came here to look at it, I realized that it had, had zero mention of his multiple honors. So I don't have that. I don't have that at my fingertip, although I do know, know two things. Um, one is that he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. The other is that in 2014, he received the Enrico Fermi Award from the Department of Energy, which is the highest honor that can be bestowed by that branch of our government. Uh, and there's actually a memento of that occasion, uh, which is a photograph of Claudio explaining his work to President Barack Obama. Um, I think it was a great picture, and I'm sure you still have it. <laughs> uh, it's also, he's also the source of one of my favorite anecdotes about interactions with the dean when I was department chair. It was, um, uh, uh, he was famous for squeezing the departments, for squeezing his departments financially. And when we were bringing uh, Claudio here to try to uh, recruit him to the faculty, we took him to a, a local restaurant and the the dean said to me, he said, you're going to, you're going to actually, if you watch this, you're going to see how, how you do a proper negotiation. So we went down there, we greeted each other, we sat at the table, and the dean then turned to Claudio and he said, I want to tell you one thing, money is no object, uh, <laughs> which I absolutely loved. Uh, Claudio, shortly before Claudio came to us, he, there was a, he published a paper in which he showed that in principle, there could be such a thing as self-application through simulated emission. And during his time at UCLA, Manny and people who worked with him, that's Manny, what am I saying? Of course, Manny. Uh, Claudio and people who worked with him were able to show that you could, you could actually construct an instrument that would work with that, with that based on that principle. And of course, now that is, the, that is the basis for the linear coherent light source, the LCLS at Stanford. At Slack, which has been nothing short of revolutionary as an instrument. And uh, I hope we'll learn a little more from him about that. So welcome, Claudio. Thank you. Well, having you as the chair and Clara Sol as the dean, when I was considering moving here, was certainly a big incentive to come here. And I never regretted it. I was very happy. I had 21 years, very happy 21 years here at UCLA. Great time. Thanks a lot. So I'm very happy to be back. And uh, on this occasion, on this happy occasion, and I want to say again, happy birthday to Bani, which had many things, our love for lasers in particular, and for physics in uh, general. And I am very pleased also to, for the successful development of the Baldwin Institute for theoretical physics. And I want to wish the Institute and to all the people in it a long and happy life, scientific life, productive life. So um, I will talk about some of the things I've been doing during the years uh, here at UCLA in collaboration with LAC and Stanford, uh, and that's X-ray lasers. Um, reading and understanding the great book on nature, as Galileo used to say, uh, what we call scientific process, uh, progress, is always or almost always enabled by the development of new and more advanced instruments to see or hear what our naked senses cannot perceive and by mathematics to make our observations quantitative. So today I will talk about the development of one of these new instruments, the X-ray free electron laser, that is helping us to continue this search I will start with a short history of X-ray lasers and X-ray free electron laser. Then I will discuss what is being done today with these instruments. And I will uh, 
and with a short description of the work in progress for to make additional steps uh, in the development of this instrument. So the work on laser started uh, in uh, 1960 when uh, Ted Maiman uh, used research lab in, uh, in Malibu, not far from here, um, operated the first ruby laser. And the crystal was pumped by a lamp obtained for a short time an inversion of the electron population to a metastable, metastable level. Uh, sorry, what have I done? Um, I, okay. You can see the energy levels of the, that were involved in this, uh, uh, in this, in this laser, uh, raising the, uh, from the ground level to the upper level, then decaying to a metastable level, and from there decaying down to the ground level again. This was a process. Uh, the raising action was due to a process which was uh, predicted by Einstein in 1916-17, uh, uh, which we call um, stimulated emission. And you can read the original paper. Uh, this was the beginning of the development of laser that now we use in so many areas, in so many applications, scientific and non-scientific. So the Ruby laser was soon followed by others. Uh, and after the initial development in the infrared and visible spectral regions, there was a continued efforts to extend the generation of coherent uh, electromagnetic radiation, intense, nearly single color, highly di directional, to shorter and shorter wavelengths. Uh, the ultimate goal was to reach the X-ray region, but there were many important steps on the way. One was the excimer laser to which Mani gave important contribution, both in the development and in the, in the applications. And why were people interested in uh, shorter wavelength laser, in particular, uh, reaching uh, X-ray, angstrom region, and femtosecond path duration? Because these are the characteristic time and space scale for uh, atomic and molecular phenomena. Once you reach this level, uh, you can do imaging of periodic and non-periodic system, non-crystalline states. You can study dynamical processes, as I will show you, in system far from equilibrium, nonlinear science. You can really open a new window on atomic and molecular phenomena of interest to biology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, I need some, can I have a way of getting a pointer on this presentation? Oh, okay, okay. All right. Uh, so if we look at the scale of phenomena, and I'm looking at the region of atomic and molecular phenomena, which are uh, of interest to more, many of us, because this is the area where all of life is, what we see around us, the flowers, the bees, the uh, other human beings like us. Uh, you have a length scale, which is in the end defined by uh, a single atom, which is one angstrom, typically. And at our level, you have the human hair, which is about 30 micron wide. Then you have the water molecule, which is a few, few angstrom, the DNA at three nanometer. And 
similarly, if you look at the time scale involved in this phenomena, you go from nanosecond to femtosecond. The femtosecond is very important. It's the equivalent of the angstrom, which defines the radius of the atom. Uh, the femtoseconds it gives you the time a valence electron takes to, to go around the nucleus. So it's like one year for us to go around the, the sun. Now with other lasers, uh, people had reached uh, by the end of the last century, the possibility of lasing at femtosecond um, time scale, but uh, the uh, length resolution was limited by the wavelength of this laser, which was mostly the visible, so around one micron. So you could explore the upper region to the left, and on the right, you could, could go down to the femtosecond. With X-rays, you could explore all the lengths, but until the X-ray laser was built, you were limited to very long time scale. What the X-ray laser was able to do was to put together to reach simultaneously both the angstrom and the femtosecond, so to allow for the first time the exploration of the lower part of this graph. Now, if you, people tried initially to use the conventional atom-based population inversion approach uh, with um, stimulated emission down to the X-rays, but that was very hard because the lifetime of the excited inner core uh, of the atomic levels uh, is very short. Chaplin and Wood at uh, Lawrence, where there was a lot of interest in X-rays, uh, estimated that the radiative lifetime of an X-ray laser transition was about one femtosecond times the scale of the wavelengths in angstrom. In addition to uh, dual population inversion, you need to raise this uh, electron from the inner level. You need to give them about 10 kV and that has to be compared with regular visible laser where you only need to give one EV. So if you put these two together, you end up with a, that you need a lot of power to get population inversion. So much power that it was really impractical, uh, but people didn't give up. Uh, they had a very powerful system, an atomic bomb and Livermore, and they used it to excite a population inversion, I believe, in a selenium uh, cylinder. Uh, and they got uh, amplified spontaneous emission. They got simulated emission in that. Apparently, it was successful. It's not been published. Uh, but it worked. And uh, there was this idea during the Cold War during the Star War time that one could put X-ray lasers in time, uh, each one with this atom bomb to drive it to destroy incoming missiles. Uh, all of that uh, was terminated. And so it was not the right way to really uh, get lab style. Uh, X-ray laser. Uh, other people try to use the, the lasers in the visible or near visible uh, region to pump cylindrical plasma. So the excitation to the higher level was done in the plasma, which was produced by these high power lasers. And these were uh, successful uh, and people uh, both at Princeton and Livermore Matthews and Livermore and Sackler at Princeton were able to obtain lasering in the range of 18 nanometer with a gain of about 100 in 85. And this work has continued and one can find a review of the most recent results 
in this paper by Sackever and Jugley in 2009. But uh, these lasers with this excitation of a creation of a plasma using a very high power laser are limited in wavelengths. They don't really reach the angstrom level. And uh, they also have limited tunability and limited power. So the way out of this difficult situation uh, was offered by the generation of electromagnetic waves from the relativistic electron beams and the few electron laser. Uh, here you can see a schematic of the few electron laser. You have an electron source, you have an electron accelerator, then you have a periodic uh, magnet in which you alternate the north and south poles to get a sinusoidal trajectory of a relativistic electron beam. And these electrons, since they are accelerated uh, within the magnet, they generate uh, radiation and uh, they generate radiation down to the uh, X-ray region. Um, the first experiment to demonstrate uh, this kind of system uh, was done at Stanford, and uh, we did uh, an experiment here in the basement of the physics building uh, later on. So, how do you go from an oscillation with the period of the magnetic uh, field, uh, what we call an ondulator magnet, which is in the centimeter range to X-ray? Well, it's the Doppler effect, which gives you a factor gamma square. Uh, between the period of the, this alternating magnet and the wavelengths of the radiation. If you take one electron and you send it to this magnet, you get a wave, which has a number of oscillation equal to the number of periods um, in the magnet. And typically, for example, for LCLS at LAC, uh, if you use 5 GV, uh, electrons, you get a gamma factor of 10 to the 4, you go from the centimeter to the angstrom uh, region. So this is the emission process. It's the equivalent of spontaneous radiative decay in an atom. Now, we need something like stimulated emission to get the laser. So uh, this was, the, this came up like, it was the FEL collective instability which is a self-organization effect, uh, which makes the waves obtained when you have many, many electrons in this beam all in phase. Uh, normally, if you have a short ondulator, like in a synchrotron radiation source, you have the electrons going through one of these magnets, they all emit waves, but they are at random. They don't overlap in phase. Because of this effect, if you build a proper ondulator long enough with the right characteristics, the system of elect the, the electrons within the electron bunch will self-organize. So what happens is that initially, if you look at the electron distribution on the scale of the wavelengths of one angstrom uh, along the main direction of motion, remember these are relativistic electrons, going along the axis of the ondulator. Initially on the scale of lambda, these electrons are at random and the radiation would be simply proportional to the number of electrons without any coherence property. But because of this interaction between the electron beam, the radiation field that is generated and the ondulator magnet, the electrons tend to organize in layers, which are about one tenth of wavelengths uh, thick and are separated exactly by lambda. So this effect, this collective instability, generates a kind of one-dimensional uh, crystal. And the planes are one-tenth of an angstrom. The separation is exactly one angstrom. They all emit in phase. Of course, you get many more photons out and you get laser-like radiation. So the result of this is that if you compare the different kind of sources that are available, 
lasers and uh, synchrotron radiation sources and free electron laser, which are on top. You see that laser can generate very high peak power. This is uh, on the left scale, you have the brilliance. The brilliance is a measure of the number of photons that you can put on a sample within a given energy interval. Uh, so it's really the most important number from an experimental point of view. <coughs> laser are great. Uh, wavelengths, uh, photon energy around one electron volt. And then as you go up in photon energy, they come down in intensity. Uh, synchrotron radiation are good uh, around a few kV. They can extend to the angstrom region if you increase the beam energy, but they have limited brightness. With free electron laser, because of these collective effects, which makes the electron work together, generate radiation together, uh, you have about nine orders of magnitude with respect to the uh, synchrotron radiation sources in peak brightness. And this makes all the difference. It doesn't happen often that in uh, building a new device, you get a factor of 10 to the nine all in one jump. And this is what happened when LCLS, as luck, started to work at around one axon in 2009. Now, what is the main difference between an idea laser, an atomic-based laser, and this uh, free electron laser? Is in the longitudinal, is in the time frequency domain. Uh, the coherence of the light generated by free electron laser, the transverse coherence in the angle and radial position is quite good, is uh, trans the, the defined by the uncertainty principle. But longitudinal is not that good. You have a spiky spectrum, which for some application is not important. If you want a better spectrum, you can always put them on automator. You have too many photons that you can do that. But ideally, we would like to have a, to modify the free electron laser so that we could have a nice uh, Gaussian uh, line with very small line widths like you do in an atomic laser. Typically, the line width uh, is for a free electron laser is 10 to the minus 3, a relative line widths. For an atomic laser, you can get 10 to the minus 7 10, or even better. So there is some room for gain in that area. In spite of this difference, these instruments have become very popular. So if you look at the, gen at the existing uh, X-ray affair today, you start from SLAC, LCLS, which started to operate in 2009. The first proposal was made in 2000, uh, in uh, uh, 100, uh, 1092, took a long time. Uh, to the right, there is Sakla in Japan. Uh, there are down here Fermi and Flash, one in Trieste, one in the Hamburg, uh, which are soft X-ray FCL. There is one in Korea. In uh, Japan, there is an in China, there is an operation, a soft X-ray FEL in Shanghai. The European FEL has now been working for a few years. And then the scale of this system is kilometers in length. LCLS, the accelerator is kilometer, one kilometer, and then you need a long distance for the beam line transporting the X-ray to the experimental area because these X-rays, when they come out of the ondulator, uh, are very well collimated. The angle, typical angle is one micro radians. So the intensity is very strong. You, you need to let them go before you can put anything on that kind of X-ray beam and have it survive, a mirror or anything. So the scale is kilometers, and the scale for the European XFL is several kilometers. They are big systems. 
The energy is up to 15 GeV for LCLS, the electron energy for the European X cell, which is based on a superconducting LINAC, uh, is 20 or 17 GeV. <coughs> it makes it even longer. Um, LCLS is uh, undergoing an upgrade, a superconducting accelerator, continuous wave. It's being added to the existing accelerator. You can see it uh, uh, here, LCLS2. This is a 4 GeV superconducting LINAC, which will be extended in energy to 8 GeV with LCLS2 high energy. This is, is an approved program. Uh, a superconducting, superconducting accelerator for a hard X-ray um, continuous wave is being designed in China. And there is another X-ray FEL in uh, Switzerland, the Swiss FEL at TSI. So from the initial LCLS, now there is a growing family of these facilities. And as I was saying before, after the accelerator, you need the experimental area. This were the original experimental area for LCLS, divided uh, for type of size that you want to do. So there is the coherent X-ray imaging hatch, the molecular and optical science, uh, soft X-ray, uh, uh, palm, palm probe uh, studies, scattering, and so on and so forth. So there are a number of experimental station. You also see here the size, the one kilometer LINAC, and then you almost double the size with the experimental station. With LCLS2, there will be more experimental station adding more capabilities. And all of this is being done now and will be ready hopefully pretty soon. The new superconducting Linux should start, the construction has been completed. We should start operation, should have electrons accelerated in a few months. Okay, let me go now to discuss shortly some of the results that have been obtained with this uh, uh, X-ray lasers. This, I mean, I've chosen a few. This is what I like. Another person would have chosen different example. Uh, this is what is called molecular movies. Um, you take uh, a molecule and you shine a photon on it. You can see the structure of the molecule here initially before the photon arrives, then you shine an infrared uh, photon on it, and something happens to this molecule. This is uh, a molecule which is part of our vision system. So it interacts with photon. And uh, when you do that, you can see, you take a series of pictures, and there should be a movie. Where is the movie? You can see how the opening of this hexagonal structure happens. You can see the motion of the nuclei on a time, the, the whole process to go from the initial configuration to the final configuration under the action of this infrared photon that is hitting the molecule takes place in 30 femtoseconds. So this is a movie it's a fast movie, <laughs> but you can really see, I think this is for the first time. When I used to think of chemistry when I was in college, they told me this is the initial state, this is the final state. No one even considered what was going on in between. Now we can see it. 
So this is the same, essentially. The molecule is uh, cyclohexadine and in, it transforms into 135-hexadine. So the, there is this rapid expansion of the carbon bonds and then within a certain time, uh, you reach the final state. So they, I think this is wonderful. <laughs> you can see these details. You know. Really the dynamics. Uh, this is the effect of having the angstrom temporal second resolution. Here's another molecule. Uh, and uh, in this case, you can see the oscillation of this uh, um, the atomic molecules under again the effect of uh, an external excitation. Uh, you can do nonlinear uh, science, uh, in particular, nonlinear contour scattering has been done because the, you can focus in this uh, X ray pulse with a, an energy of about one millijoule in the pulse to a radius of 60, 70 nanometer. So you can reach a power density in uh, this experiment of 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20 watts per square centimeter. And with improvements in the X-ray laser, you could go up to 10 to the 23 uh, <coughs> watts per square centimeter, which is uh, 1,000 of the Schwinger field. But in this case, uh, uh, the maximum X-ray intensity reached was four times 10 to the 20 watts per square centimeter. You could move the sample in and out of this focus where you had the maximum intensity and where you were at the peak of the intensity, uh, you could see the generation of two photons. Uh, from one incoming photon. So this is a clearly nonlinear effect down at nine KV. Ah, this is another one that I like, the study of the photosystem two. The photosystem two is a protein complex in plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. Uh, this is the process that is responsible for splitting water and producing the oxygen that we breathe. So th there is uh, the, um, in two important groups working on uh, understanding this process with force. How this happened, photosynthesis has been uh, not known until very recently. Now we know almost completely how things are going. And there is this big group that has been working on this. And it's a wonderful process because you, in the photosystem too, you start with, oh, with water, sorry, and a few photons coming from the sun. And out of the system, you get oxygen and uh, hydrogen. So if you look at this, this would be an ideal energy source. Because once you get the, well, the oxygen, you get the hydrogen, you can store the hydrogen, you can burn it, and you reproduce water, clean and nice. So if we could understand all the steps that the plant uh, and algae is doing in, the, uh, in this process, we would have solved all our problems. Uh, and this has also been important in the history of life on this planet um, through the action of the cyanobacteria uh, if you go back in time to about 3 billion years ago, there was essentially no oxygen in the atmosphere. This well was very different from what we know today. Today we have about 20% of oxygen in the atmosphere. And all this oxygen has been coming from the action of this cyanobacteria doing this kind of job for a long, very long time. So they uh, first filled the ocean, there is this uh, you know, BIF uh, period when the oxygen combined with iron in the water of the ocean 
generating layer of um, iron oxide, which is still the main uh, source of iron ore today. Uh, until essentially all the water was saturated with oxygen and then the oxygen started to come out in the atmosphere and we could see the development of life as we know now. So this is a very important uh, phenomenon. And this is the structure of this protein, the photosystem too is quite complicated as you can see, but people have been working hard to understand how it works. And in particular inside this uh, complicated structure, this is not my field, so I really cannot give you all the details. But there is a cluster of uh, manganese uh, with also a calcium uh, atom, which where um, most of the action is taking place where you really have this uh, photon coming in, water coming in, oxygen and hydrogen going out. To really understand this process, you need to study the chemistry which is involved and you need to understand the structural changes in the structure of this uh, manganese cluster. So you need to do diffraction imaging of how the cluster changes and at the same time, you need to do uh, spectroscopy to understand the chemical, uh, uh, the chemical changes. Uh, the, there are several time scales, so you need to take all these steps. It's a complicated work. And this is how the experiments uh, works. You have these crystals of uh, photosystem two that come down on a liquid jet. And so there are the crystals, there are the laser flashing to give the photons that you need, the equivalent of the solar light that you need to generate the process. And then you do diffraction imaging, coherent diffraction imaging on a very fast time scale, a couple of femtoseconds, to determine the change in the structure of this manganese cluster. And so when you do all of this, you can do it with a resolution of about two angstrom, couple of femtoseconds, uh, you, you start to understand all that is going on in this system. And by now we know almost all the details. So hopefully we'll be able very soon to completely understand, perhaps also to reproduce by ourselves this process. This is another experiment that I like. In this case, we used uh, attosecond uh, pulses to study coherent electron motion. When you go below the femtosecond, you can really see the motion of individual electrons, and you can see the motion of groups of electrons in this uh, J Meitner uh, decay. So this was uh, uh, nitric oxide uh, gas uh, illuminated by about one uh, uh, 500 uh, EV laser light from, X, from LCLS. <coughs> And one of the problems when you do this kind of experiment, you have this very fast excitation, you want to see how uh, the electrons move all together. Uh, you need an instrument to see this motion. So what they did, what this group did was to add a circularly polarized uh, laser, uh, infrared laser with a period of eight, eight femtoseconds uh, which was uh, acting as a clock. So out of this, you can get uh, results like, like this. What you have here on the left is the rotating vector potential of the wave. On the outer boundary of the circle, you see the intensity of electrons in the red. These are the Auger electrons and the 
in the inner circle, you have the other minor electron. And here you can plot the Roger yield on a time scale of eight femtosecond, and you can establish uh, this um, coherent motion of the electrons. So you can really see uh, chemical reaction. You can see atoms, the nucleus uh, moving during a chemical reaction, but you can even see the electron motion uh, within the system that you're applying. So it's really the dynamics that you can do. That, that's what excites me. Now, at the beginning, of, how much time do I have? Great. Okay, uh, I say that um, doing population inversion at X-ray wavelengths requires a lot of power. It's very difficult. On the other hand, it turns out that the X-ray FEL is an ideal pump, like you have a diode laser in which you use a laser to pump a gain medium because you use exactly the wavelengths that you need to do the population inversion. So. You, when you explode an atomic bomb, you have X-rays over a very wide energy range. They go all over the four pi. Uh, here, you have only you can only have X-rays at the right frequency, and they are well collimated. So you put all of them where you need them. So you have a dramatic reduction in the amount of power that you need. And um, uh, it turns out that an, an X-ray FEL is really a wonderful instrument to pump uh, an atomic X-ray uh, laser. So this experiment was done in 2012 uh, using um, the K alpha line on neon. And they showed that by uh, increasing the pulse energy uh, or the X-ray, uh, you can have an increasing population inversion and you can get a larger, an exponentially larger uh, number of lasing photons coming out. So this is a demonstration of simulated uh, emission due to population inversion, you can see all the levels that are uh, involved in this. The experiments, and you can see that you can get a very narrow line out of this, the, uh, the K alpha line is the one on the left. The one on the right is the spectrum of the pump pulse, uh, which tends to move in energy, but in this case, since you are only using it as a pump, it doesn't matter. Whatever is the frequency within a reasonable limit, a 1% change in the pump pulse wavelength doesn't affect the K alpha line of the neon. The experiment has been redone uh, in uh, copper. And here you see the same effect. There is a threshold uh, on this plot. You see the yield of K alpha uh, one photons. And there is a threshold for this when you reach population inversion equal to the decay. And then you grow exponentially. And um, the experiment has been repeated also by using, in addition to the pump pulse, a seed pulse from the same X-ray for electron laser. Uh, the pump pulse was a 9 kV to generate the population inversion. The seed pulse was at 8 kV, which is the K alpha line energy. So by adding a few photons at the right energy, you stimulate the stimulated emission process, you start the stimulated emission process, and you get a much larger yield for the same amount of power of the pump. And this can be done uh, in a few electron laser because you had the ondulator uh, generating the photons, and by changing the gap of the ondulator, changing the magnetic field, you can change the energy of the photons that you generate. 
So they use part of the ondulator to generate 8 kV, part of the ondulator to generate 9 kV, and they did this very nice demonstration. Okay. Uh, so putting it, it all together, it uh, looked to us that uh, using this process uh, and using not a single pump pulse, but a train of pump pulses, we could build an oscillator and an oscillator has clear advantages. It really gives you the best optical properties and we decided to build one uh, using again the copper alpha line um, and adding to uh, it a train of pulses, pump pulses from LCLS. So we had to modify LCLS to generate not a single uh, X-ray pulse, but train of pulses. And then we had to add a, an optical cavity based on the Bragg reflection using silicon or diamond. And all of this is in uh, construction. And you see here again, the process, you can start the process with noise or with some seed. And uh, this is, these are the levels that we want to utilize. And on the bottom, you see a dynamic <laughs> representation of the process. What came out of the simulation that we did for this process is that you can reach saturation very fast. From four to five pump pulses and four to five circulation within the cavity, you can reach uh, saturation. These are the result of the numerical simulation. And if we make a plot of the product of the pulse lengths and the energy resolution, in a few pulses, you reach the transform limit, which means that you have, you generate an X-ray pulse, uh, which is practically a Gaussian with a well-defined phase throughout it. And that would allow all kinds of new experiments uh, using these X-rays and you still get uh, good intensity. You can see here the main characteristics of, for this initial simulation. Of course, once it works, one can do even better. While waiting for this, there has been another experiment which has been published a couple of months ago in which we show the capability of controlling the phase in these processes using population inversion and a real atomic laser uh, by using two uh, pump pulses. You can see here on this uh, drawing, you had two pump pulses from an, uh, from an X-ray free electron laser and they generate population inversion uh, and they generate two pulses through uh, population inversion and simulated emission. Now, while these pump pulses are not coherent longitudinally, they, they have large energy spread and they don't have a well-defined phase, the two coming out uh, after this process have very well-defined phase and depending on the distance, they can interfere and generate these very nice uh, interference uh, patterns. So from this, you can measure the separation in time, analyzing the energy of this process, uh, the energy separation of this uh, stripe. And you can even use this to do interferometry and measure in very, very short time. So this has been demonstrated. The oscillator will take some more time. Okay, end of the talk. We started seeing small things about 400 years ago, when for the first time we were able to see 
to the invention of the, of the telescope and of the microscope, uh, things that we were not able to see with our own eyes. Uh, our own eye uh, has a resolution of about 0.1 millimeter and the time resolution of about 0.1 seconds. With the invention of the microscope, uh, people were able to see 0.01 millimeter. The time resolution remained the same, but the space resolution increased by a factor of 10. And that led to the publication of the first paper uh, based on microscopic observation by Francesco Stelluti in 1630. He took a, a beam and with the microscope was able to see details which, which had not been seen before. So that was about 400 years ago and today with LCLS and the other X-ray field electron laser, we have been able to push this to angstrom, big factor in space resolution, to femtosecond, an even bigger factor in time resolution. And we are all aware, I mean, these are, these are all new things. There is a lot to explore using this novel capability. So we continue to, to do that. Okay, thank you. So I, I have a dream. I wonder whether you uh, could <laughs> demolish it completely where one could, the, with gamma ray lasers, see, get to the point where you could go from a, the scale of an atom, an angstrom, to a nuclear size and see the motion of quarks in the nuclear. Ah. <laughs> a lot of young people here. They work to do. We have done our part. <laughs> but I mean, sure, people are talking about gamma ray lasers and so on and so forth. And uh, it takes time and patience, but uh, we'll move ahead. There is a large interest in increasing the photon energy for this X ray free electron laser from 10 keV to 100 keV. And I don't think there is a real limit to going to even higher energy to reaching the MVG level. So, good. <laughs> so, so I guess uh, you, you sort of answered the question but mine was very related. Could, could you imagine a population inversion laser using nuclear transitions? Uh. I didn't think about it, but I, so I find some sort I mean, of metastable state in uh, uh, nuclei, and I don't know. You perhaps you can think about it. See if it's doable, and what kind of pump would be required? Probably and, a nuclear pump. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's an interesting field to expand it to even higher energy to these levels and. Uh, do you know if there's work done in this direction? Or? There are papers that appear once in a while on uh, the, these subjects, and uh, there are people thinking about it. So, as we move ahead, I mean, in a way, this is a, still a new field. There are now uh, these facilities that I've shown you, but they're all new. And in a way, they are so new that uh, we are still in the learning process on how to use them in an effective way. So the characteristics are so different uh, that this uh, one needs to learn what is the best use of it. We have some good examples on innovative use, looking at things that really we couldn't do before. But there is much more to learn. And the instrumentation going with it um, also uh, is being developed and uh, pushed ahead. And as these things uh, continue, uh, I think people will, uh, th there is a real interest for a number of applications of going to higher photon energy. 
So certainly to the hundred KV region and after that to the MEV region and so we'll see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks for a great talk. I, I had a question actually about the molecular movies. Um, when you are looking at the di it's snapshots of the dynamics of these molecules, um, it seems like you're passing an ins a really insanely intense field over them. And I, I would assume that the molecule itself would deform under the electric force of that transient electric field. And that would change the dynamics that sort of um, otherwise, yeah, these unperturbed dynamics of the uh, molecules. So I guess the question is, how do you disentangle the force applied by the imaging uh, wave itself from the uh, from the back the dynamics you're trying to study in the moving molecules? Uh, I mean, these things have been. Uh, it's a good point, and um, this problem and the whole process has been analyzed in detail <coughs> with theory and simulations. The number of uh, photons that you really, th this is not done uh, with a very tight focus, like was done, for instance, for the uh, experiment in which you do the population inversion in copper, where you go to these very high fields, 10 to the 20 watts per square centimeter. Certainly, uh, there you have an electric field, which is near to the atomic, uh, inner atomic electric field, and you would have big effect. Uh, in the case of the nonlinear contour scattering, also you are in the regime, but that's the regime that you want to study. In this case, the power density is not that high. So the electric field that acts on this molecule is, uh, is not very large. So there shouldn't be this kind of effect. This has been analyzed in detail. So if you look at the um, paper which I mentioned, then you can see that uh, this has been considered. In the, you really want to have uh, um, X-ray laser pulp with a much larger radius, and then you look at the scattering of the... Not, not I mean, in principle, you can do it. 